Investigators zero in on a theory that may explain the fatal accident that killed John F. Kennedy Jr., his wife Carolyn, and her sister Lauren. At the center of it all, a pilot in over his head, battling a mounting list of pressures. In hazy conditions, Kennedy would have no visual reference to tell him which way is up. As it was getting dark in marginal conditions, he was in a very precarious area for visual flight roll and VFR flying. As he headed out over the water and all those lights were behind him, all that visual reference was gone. He looks away from his instruments for like a second. Just something away with the radio, no big deal. While all of that's going on, it's quite easy for the airplane to slip into a little bit of a bank, one direction or another. If you're in a turn for an extended period of time, your inner ear can feel a reverse of the turn, and you can get, become spatially disoriented very easily. It can't be. He looks back. His instruments are telling him one thing. His sense is another. What the? You have to be well trained to disregard what your brain is saying and look at your instruments, work on your scan, and fly by your instruments. Once he becomes disoriented, Kennedy is too inexperienced to force himself to believe his instruments, no matter what his senses are telling him. Nothing's working. Spatial disorientation. break down and understand what happened on board Air France Flight 447, oh, really? CBS News aviation and safety and expert Air Captain Air Chesley Sully Sullenberger took us into an outside. Airbus simulator. This is going from neutral to full uh, nose up command, full aft side stick. That's it right there, that one little movement. That small movement on the Airbus flight controls or side stick raises the nose of the plane and instructs it to climb pilots rarely perform the maneuver at high altitudes because it can be very dangerous. But that is exactly what one Flight 447 pilot did. Around 2.05 a.m., when the Airbus A330 was flying through a storm system, all three of its speed indicators stopped working. As a result, the aircraft's autopilot turned off. With a captain on break, the two co-pilots were forced to fly the plane manually. The least experienced pilot, 32-year-old Pierre Bonin, was in the right seat and said, I have the controls. Co-pilot David Robert was in the left seat, and even though considerably more experienced, he let Bonin fly. Theoretically, it was possible to still fly the airplane under those conditions. Challenging, but manageable. Yes. Although they lost the autopilot and speed indicators, they were flying normally and safely. But then suddenly, and without Robert knowing, Bonin does something almost inexplicable. He pulls back on his side stick and raises the nose of the plane. That causes the aircraft to fall and the stall warning sounds. That's, that's the stall alarm. Stall alarm. Over the next four and a half minutes, the stall warning will sound 75 times. But strangely, neither pilot will mention it. And unbeknownst to Robert, Bonin will keep the nose of the plane up almost the entire time. Exactly what he shouldn't do a decision that experts still can't understand. It's difficult to explain that. I just don't know why he did that. Because of Bonin's actions, the plane is attempting to climb, but is actually losing altitude. Robert appears to have no idea the nose is being lifted when he says, what the hell is happening? I don't understand what's happening. If he had known what Bonin was doing, Robert could have conceivably solved the problem very easily at this point. 
At 2.10 a.m., five minutes after the autopilot disengaged, the Airbus A330 continues to lose significant altitude as the captain re-enters the cockpit and says, what the hell are you doing? Bonin, the least experienced pilot, continues to hold back on his side stick but still doesn't seem to understand what's happening. We've lost control of the airplane, Bonin says. Robert tells the captain, we've totally lost control of the plane. We don't understand at all. Almost a minute later, as the plane is now just 10,000 feet above the surface of the ocean, Bonin finally reveals the crucial information they've needed. He shouts, I've had the stick back the whole time. Robert seems to instantly realize what's going on. He jumps in and says, give me the controls, give me the controls. But it's too late. About 40 seconds later, the two co-pilots say what will be their last words. Robert, damn it, we're going to crash. This can't be happening. Bonin, but what's happening? Four seconds after that, the voice recorder cuts out. If we only blame the pilots, we will not have changed any of the fundamental underlying conditions. We won't have done our best to prevent this from happening again. I was running a space shuttle for NASA. Modern warfare, instant access to battlefield information was essential. We developed a new kind of network, constantly updated, immediately shared and totally secure to serve a battlefield where information was power. Everybody periodically broadcast bits of information about where they were, what they were doing. We would all recognize it today as the cloud. Sort of like an instant Google, and this was three, four decades before Google.